I love driving. I not only love driving, I also love technology. And that is why I was amazed when I saw in 2007 the DARPA Grand Challenge take place in the Mojave Desert, where 150 miles across this desert, cars completely autonomously drove and reached their destination. I was much more amazed when I saw in 2013 that Mercedes-Benz took a route Bertha Benz took in August 1888 with the first Benz from Mannheim to Heidelberg. And when Mercedes completely autonomously drove all there over this bridge. And actually this bridge crossing Heidelberg is the bridge I use for my morning jog. And I always thought, well, why don't we have this in medicine? And just to give you a little bit of information about medicine, I can tell you one thing. Surgery is complex, much more complex than you think. We always think about surgery only about the single operation, but it's not it. We have a pre-operative phase and we have a post-operative phase. And if you don't care about that, you're not a good surgeon and you're not a good physician. Why? Because you can do a perfect operation, but on the wrong patient. If your pre-operative assessment is not the right one, not so good. Same thing, you do perfect operation, perfect pre-operative preparation, and then you after the, after the operation, you say, ah, no, nah, I did it, uh, everything is fine. That's not going to work out. You have to take care of the patient, and you have to see what is going on with him after the operation as well. So it's a whole process. And just to give you an image how difficult it is and how much uh, data we already have for one single patient, I show you this diagram. Uh, this is a patient who received a liver transplantation in our hospital. And what you see here is all his laboratory parameters. And on the x-axis, you can see the days. And on the y-axis, you can see the relative height of the parameters. So who in this room can tell me whether this patient is well or not? Well, impossible. I can't either. Usually, it's not represented like that. It's much more in a tabular form. But I'll show you one thing. What you have to look for is complication patterns. And this complication pattern, for example, is the operation here in the first days elevates liver enzymes inside of the blood, which is okay, which is normal. But then they fall down, which is also normal, but then there is this double peak formation. On day nine, it's building up, and then it's fully there. If you take care of this patient on day nine, he will be fine. That is what happened in this case. But if you wait too long, time to response, this patient might die. He did not. He is now well off. But just to show you, this is the patterns that we train and that we have to provide all patients. Because there are more patients inside of our hospital than only one. And they come in different phases. And there is also a different effort. And also different diseases. And not only that, inside of the hospital we also have different specialities. So what do we do? How do we train all this and how do we go there? Well, one thing is we specialize, specialization for everything, but we also have to look on medical literature and you have to train your whole life. How do you do that? Well, you go on Medline. Medline is our worldwide medical library. And there, just to give you an impression how much it is, last year were 185,000 publications released Tagged surgery. I read them all. <laughs> okay, so reality is we have to take care of our patients. We have to take care and taking into account all his individual data, may it be imaging, may it be laboratory parameters or whatever, and also our experience and also experience from other people uh, in concerning studies or guidelines, etc. All this in a very complex setting. Well, this may lead to error. And what you can see here is the Swiss cheese model. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's rather fascinating. To err is human. You see here a lot of layers, and each layer represents a human, so a nurse or a doctor. And on the far left corner, you can see an error. And this error passes each layer. So it's not seen by the nurse, it's not seen by the doctor. Happens every day. But what comes out? If we have a lot of layers and nobody sees the error, maybe it becomes a fatal error. 
And what do we need? There is so many possibilities. There are so many different um, diseases and also so much data that we need an assistant. We need a cognitive assistant. We need a human-like machine that perceives information, uses a knowledge base, interprets the data based on the perception and the knowledge, ba knowledge base to perform an intelligent, context-aware action. And I will show you some examples that we performed in this area. And I want to say that none of this is only my work. It's rather a joint effort of a multidisciplinary team and mostly together with other medical colleagues, but also with the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and the German Cancer Research Center. And together, we made all this possible. So just an example, perioperative imaging. Maybe you are familiar with CAT scans. So this is an example of a CAT scan of a patient with a colorectal metastasis. So whoever now sees it already is very good. We are very good in pattern recognition. I will help you. The liver is on the left side of the picture. And there in the middle, you can see this small, uh, well, we say hypodense lesion, small lesion. So that's what usually the radiologist sees. And yesterday, radiology worked like this. He took his dictaphone, he saw this lesion, and he dictated a prose text. So his individual, analog, human interpretation of this lesion. And then the next radiologist came, and the next radiologist, the next radiologist, and you had the picture on one side, and you had on the other side the texts. But they were not together in one database. So what is possible today, you not only look at that, but you just really measure each individual lesion. And then you can see a diameter, but not only the diameter, there are lots of parameters that you can generate out of this and also follow it up through the course of the disease. Well, what can you do with this then is to implement clinical guidelines that are respected internationally, in this case, the RESIST 1.1 guideline, and together with those profiles and those categories and attributes, you can really perform a context-adaptive report. So you will have one, for example, for prostate cancer, you will have one for lung cancer, you will have one for chemotherapy follow-up. But what is also much more important is that you just combined the image and the information in one report. And what you really can do then is that all of your images on all your data is then a searchable database in clinical routine use. Imagine what is possible with a technology like that. Well, I'm a surgeon, so I have to talk about surgery, and I'm uh, also inside of the operating room. I looked at all the pictures preoperatively. Well, I can show you one of our modern hybrid ORs, and what you can see there is a very complex setting. It got more and more and more, and there are a lot of medical devices. In fact, in our hospital alone, there are 40,000 medical devices today just to improve or just to take care of the patient in the best way possible. 40,000. And all of these medical devices are effectors, and that's what they, what they are well meant to be. They do something for the patient, or we do something with them for the patient. But what I want to say to you is that they are not only effectors, they are in, in reality also sensors. Just to give you an example, we use to open the abdomen that is necessary for the operation an electric scalpel. And this electric scalpel we use, and then operation begins. Usually, when you're not seeing an electric scalpel as a sensor, the uh, uh, nurse and the anesthesiologist will ask after the operation, ah, man, wow, it took a long time. Uh, what do you think? When did we start the operation? And the nurse will say, I think it was 2.30. And then the anesthesiologist will say, I think it was 2.50. Okay, let's say 2.40. Well, that's maybe not how it should be done. It should not be done by a human. It's also a surplus effort of documentation. And you have the electric scalpel who knew when it was if it were not that dump. So you have to integrate those information as sensor data. Well, and these images are not very faint of heart, but uh, I think you will have a nice impression of how a 3D representation of 
the abdomen can be made on the upper left corner and how clinical tasks can be assessed and can be seen and um, extracted from the imaging, which you can see uh, on the upper images. And on the lower right, you can see that the different parameters change throughout the operation. So for each phase of the operation, you will have a different activation of set of medical devices. Well, you take this, and this is how an abdomen looks like when you do laparoscopic surgery. So you take this and give this a computer, and then he can interpret what phase of the operation are we at. And that's can, that you can see on the right-hand corner. And then you can show perioperative imaging, preoperative imaging, intraoperative in a context-aware manner, so you can see the relevant information for this phase. Or you can say, well, probably the operation is in phase three, it will take another 30 minutes to finish it, so I will inform the nurse on the ward to bring the next patient, and she can organize herself in a better way. It's not only that process optimization, it's also automation of surgical tasks. So what we did is we trained a robot to guide the laparoscopic camera. And this laparoscopic camera was trained on 20 operations. And these 20 operations was, were then calculated like good image, bad image, and medium image. And from that, it was able to anticipate the next moves up of the surgeon and was truly able to assist the surgeon and not only follow the surgical instruments because sometimes they are out of view and they should be out of view because the more interesting part is in the lower abdomen and focused on the other instrument. But it's not enough to talk about the operation room. It's also about clinical processes and it's also about the hospital. Here you can see 18,000 patients following a clinical process inside of our hospital. And we depicted this and what you can see here are these cohorts. And what is very astounding about these cohorts is that there are similarities between cohorts that were not obvious before because it were different specialties. One was visceral surgery, one was urology, and they did not realize that they have patients that go together very well. Well, I talked about the building. We will have a new building, a new surgical building in Heidelberg, which I can take care of, uh, and it will be opened in 2019. And what we, what we do there is you have to give all of this a home. And we will have a very nice home, and these rooms will be staffed with parts of this technology to really enable a digital clinic. And what you can see here is the digital sibling that we already established, which is now our intermediate care unit. And what you can see here is the clinical processes evolve inside of the hospital. You can see the nurse caring for the patient. You can see a visitor and you can follow all of those processes. What can you do with it? You can do education, you can do validation, you can do training on it, and you can also do process optimization. And also, there are doctors walking over there in the LA, and you can watch them go on the morning round, and after the morning round, go to the OR, all inside of this virtual model, speaking of the doctor. Now, one of the most fascinating things are these cognitive agents that are already out there. So maybe you know the IBM Watson system, and we call this system Watson MD. And what we did, we had access together with our friends in, at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology to the IBM Watson Explorer program. And the Watson Explorer program lets you, well, work on a certain project. And we said, hey, why not pass the USMLE? USMLE is the United States Medical Licensing Exam, and we tried to pass this exam with that system. Well, what you can see here is an example question, and you can see that they are rather complex. So there's a long story, and again, there is relevant information, there is much irrelevant information, and you have nine possible answers. Guessing rate is about 15%. If you are pretty knowledgeable or with, human, uh, with good human sense, you would make it probably to 25, but not much more. Um, we trained this system, 
And this system learned by Wikipedia, all the medical articles there, which were around 40,000, and also some open source medical textbooks. And then also trained the system on 800 USMLE questions. And guess what, how much we, get, we got? Well, we did not pass the exam. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have changed my profession maybe long ago, no. It, we are close, we were close. It was 50%, which is much more than an average surgeon would uh, be able to do when he, uh, when he is five or six years in, in, uh, in the clinic. 65% uh, are there to pass, and you won't uh, want a system that passes with 65% that is clear and take care of this. But just imagine what it means. United States Medical Licensing Exam. When you pass it, you are allowed to diagnose. You are allowed to administer therapies. And let me say this, I think by 2020, this system will pass that test and will change our future. And what I really love is driving. <laughs> and uh, I would love to drive a Tesla. This is not possible now, but what they do is right. It's amazing what they did. They issued an update and the Model S could drive autonomously, just like that. Isn't that amazing? And then another issue, and the car drove faster. An uh, issue of an update, and the car drove faster. So I think this is really a paradigm that we will have to adapt, adopt. This is the thing that updates will be driving the healthcare revolution. Why? Because we started eminence-based. Eminence-based is the one very good surgeon, the one very good physician who has 100 cases in his mind. But the next step will be to implement evidence-based medicine inside of them. You can remember a few studies, but not all of them. But combine them inside of a system, a cognitive system, with real-world data. And then you will be truly there that software will be a drug. Software as a drug that will update our healthcare system and perceive information based on a knowledge base, interpret it and give an appropriate context-aware action. This is true. Context-aware intelligence assistant, assistance will come and they will provide everybody, the patient, the surgeon, the nurse, even the manager, with the right action, the relevant inf information at the right time, at the right place. And this will happen very soon. Thank you.